somebody put your hands together and celebrate your limited God, the God of all possibilities. Your limited God. Come on, somebody celebrate him tonight. Celebrate him tonight. Hallelujah. Lift your two hands with me all over this place. The unlimited God, self-replenishing, the big-breasted one. You're the one that we're worshiping tonight. We ask that you accept our worship. We thank you for your presence that is already here. At your presence, mountains, they skip like round. And even Jordan packed into two. So we thank you because of situations and issues that shall be resolved here tonight. We thank you for confusion that is giving way to divine direction. We thank you because as we look unto you tonight, our faces shall be lightened and shame shall be far away from us. The word says they go from strength to strength as they appear before the Lord delay in Zion. We ask that you replenish our strength today. Let someone pass on to a new level of power. And let your name be glorified. Pray upon your word tonight. Let it minister grace to every hearer. Everyone present here, everyone watching online. We ask tonight, let your grace rest upon everyone. Let your word open up to us. Grant us understanding. Illuminate our hearts. Let darkness not have a place in our heart. We thank you and we praise you. Holy Spirit, reveal yourself in this service tonight. Let it not be the word of a man. Let it be your word. Let revelation knowledge flow freely. We thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' precious name. If you are excited to be in church tonight, put your hands together to celebrate Jesus. Hallelujah. Please, you may have your seat. Have your seat. Praise God. Can you help me ask your neighbor, how's your week been? So it's nice to sit beside you. Praise God. You know, when you sit beside someone in a restaurant and they don't have very good table manners, they can give you a horrible experience. Am I saying the truth? Yeah, so there's also table manners in God's presence. But it's spiritual food that we've come to eat. Yeah. So if your neighbor is fiddling with phone and playing something that can distract you, you can change your seat. Yeah. Just move somewhere. Just do it quietly. Or just tell them table manners. <laughs> yeah. Spiritual table manners. Yeah, because this is spiritual menu. Praise God. I said, praise God. Tonight we're discussing a very important topic, why God wants you to prosper. Or if I can personalize it, why God wants me to prosper. Why God wants me to prosper. If you were not in church on Sunday, or maybe uh, this is not your regular Sunday church and you just came to worship with us tonight, we started a teaching series on Sunday uh, that we titled The Liberal Soul, Getting Stronger in Generosity. So for the rest of the month, we're discussing the subject of generosity. And you can't discuss generosity without discussing stewardship uh, and you, without discussing the subject of financial prosperity. The Bible says, the liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that water shall be watered himself also. I think that's Proverbs 11, 25 or so. Uh, he that water shall be watered himself also. So it's important that you, you understand that God wants us to get stronger in generosity. If you're not around on Sunday, I want to encourage you to get the message of any of the services. I was privileged to preach the three services this last Sunday. I want you to uh, you know, get any of the messages and listen again and again. If you have internet access, you can also do the same on YouTube or on the Elevation Church Hub. It will bless your heart a great deal. Praise God. All right. Why? Does God want me to be prosperous? It's important to note that wealth is an offshoot of divine prosperity. You can't be blessed without being prosperous or rich, but you can be rich without being blessed. 
Because the blessing we're talking about is not, the Bible says the blessing of the Lord, it makes one rich and hath no sorrow. So it's not the general blessing. It's not the one that uh, somebody sneezes beside you and says, bless you, bless you. Yeah. It doesn't mean that because the person sneezed, the person is blessed. <laughs> I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. The blessing that we're talking about is the blessing that is traceable to the blessed man Abraham. That's the source of our blessing. That's the, 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 the genealogy of our blessing. That's the genealogy of our blessing. So uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Can you put that up for me? Galatians 3, 13 and 14. The Bible says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Verse 14 says that the blessing of Abraham, somebody say the blessing of Abraham. Come on, say it again. Say the blessing of Abraham. So let me tell your neighbor, say we're not talking about general blessing. We're talking about the blessing of Abraham. Says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. The Gentiles in Christ Jesus. Gentiles generally speaks of anyone that is not a natural Jew who is a Gentile. So according to uh, um, Bible days, especially Old Testament, you are either a Jew or a Gentile. So whether you are Greek, Roman, or anything, all of them, including everybody. In Africa, Gentile. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. God started by cutting a covenant with a people through Abraham. One person. A covenant with one person. And because he said, I will make you a great nation, it became a covenant with the whole nation, the Jewish nation. And anyone that is not a natural Jew then becomes a Gentile. In the New Testament, the word Gentile does not only speak to anyone that is not a natural Jew, it also speaks to anyone that is not in joint hairs with Christ. Anyone that is not in Christ. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Because we no longer, God in the New Testament is not only now relating covenant wise with the descendant of Abraham alone. But everyone that has come into the same covenant through Christ. So, in, in, New, in the New Testament terminology, I'm no longer a Gentile. Because the Bible says, I mean, Paul was writing somewhere, he said, we should not walk, I think, Ephesians 4 uh, um, and verse 7 or so, not walk in the fertility of our mind like um, Gentiles. Yeah. Like Gentiles, you know. So, and when he was writing that in Ephesians 2, the church at Ephesus, they were not all Jews. Because I think Ephesus is a city in, um, in Greece, around, somewhere around there, between Greece and Turkey or so. Yeah. So they were not all Jews. So the, 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 look at the scripture I was talking about, Ephesians 4, verse 17, that I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of your mind. Yeah. So, Gentiles today, we can say, not only people who are not natural Jews, but people who are not in Christ. But the Bible says that the blessing of Abraham may come upon the Gentiles, people who are not natural Jews, that we may be grafted in into the same covenant. So everyone who used to be a Gentile that is now in Christ has come under the same covenant. Somebody say, I'm blessed. You come and say it again, say, I'm blessed. That's all the point I've been trying to establish. That you are blessed. <laughs> and that if you are in Christ, you have come under the covenant of Abraham. Which is a covenant of blessing. So I say it again, I'm blessed. I say it again, I'm blessed. I'm not satisfied. I say it again. I am blessed. Glory be to Jesus. But you know, if you have a bit of a religious background, there are certain scriptures in the Holy Bible that people have used to justify the mindset that the poorer you are, then the holier you should be, or the holier you are. Yeah. So when you read scriptures like um, Mark 
10 and 25, which says it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It means that the richer you are, or, I mean, I'm saying the way it has been <laughs> interpreted, that the richer you are, the farther you have from the kingdom of God. Am I saying the truth? Yeah. So, first and foremost, when you see a rich person, in the mind of the religious, you have seen an unbeliever. Am I saying the truth? Especially if he's thinkingly rich. You know, some people say find it difficult to believe that a very wealthy man can be a candidate for heaven, a child of God, a worshiper of Jesus, a disciple of Christ. Am I saying the truth? Yeah, some people say struggle with that mindset. Struggle with that mindset. And there are so many scriptures again and again that we have used to buttress that. First Timothy chapter 6, um, First Timothy 6, 6. says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Having the promise of uh, his great gain, he said, For we brought nothing to this world, verse 7, and it is certain that we will not carry nothing with us. And having food and clothing, with this we shall be content. Some people are laughing at the scripture. It's laughable because of the kind of interpretation that we're giving it. You know, where we, we missed it in this scripture, for instance, is that we interpreted contentment for containment. If the scripture had said, godliness with containment is great gain, we will know that if you are godly and you are contained, you are at your bus stop in poverty, it's okay. Yeah. But said godliness with contentment. Contentment does not mean poverty. Contentment says, I am not where I used to be. I'm happy about where I am on the way to where I'm going. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. That's what contentment says. Contentment doesn't mean you should not aspire for the blessing of God to start to show and manifest through your life. Is somebody stay with me tonight? So, godliness with contentment is great gain. True. A statement of truth. Because godliness without contentment can take you out of your godliness. Because you get into envy and uh, covetousness because you are not content where you are. You should be content without being contained. When you lose your power of aspiration, you are contained. When you put your trust in God to take you to where you are and you celebrate today on your journey to your tomorrow, you are content. I will say together. Is somebody following me tonight? Very, very important. I'm just trying to show us some scriptures that, has, you know, that have brought us certain mindset that we should deal with. Verse 10 of the same First Timothy chapter 6 it says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. What did he say? For the somebody have tonight for the for the is it money? But the the God bless you. Tell your neighbor say love of money. Say love God, not money. Yeah. The real problem is not money. I'm talking about all these scriptures that sold the mindset to the church. But Christians are not supposed to aspire to be rich or extremely wealthy because people turn scriptures upside down. This one says, for the love of money is the root of all issues. Not money. Money is amoral. It's neither moral or immoral. Money in the hand of a good man is a good thing. Because the Bible says money answers all things. Yeah. And money uh, is a defense. Money in the hand of a bad man is a bad thing. <laughs> because he's going to use, it to use that money to crush and to destroy. Money is amoral. It's either moral or immoral. It takes the character 
of the handler. Are you still with me today? Yeah. It takes the character of the handler. So, even on this one point, if you were God, who would you want to put more into his hand? Yeah. A good man or a bad man? Because money in the hand of a good man will bring many good things. Money in the hand of an evil person will do many evil. I remember uh, a friend of mine a few years ago who brought a friend, another friend to me, uh, his friend to me, to encourage his friend. You know what happened to his friend? One of the richest men in Lagos took the wife of his friend. I didn't want to tell the guy. You can imagine, <laughs> you can imagine the kind of emotion that the guy had. This was about maybe about six years ago or so. So his friend brought him to me. His friend just called the pastor. Ah, my friend, my friend, my friend has been crying. <laughs> my friend. <laughs> he said, I don't know what to tell him again, but I think you can encourage him and just pray with him. I said, What happened? He mentioned the name. Of, if I mention the name of the man, perhaps all of you here will know the person. He mentioned the name of the person. So, very wealthy guy. The person took his wife. As we were talking, as in that day, the wife had relocated to the house of that man. Yeah. So he brought this guy to me. <laughs> so you can imagine what I'm talking about. Yeah. The friend of my friend did not have money to fight the rich man. Somebody said, hey, yeah. That's the evil that money can, you know, bring when money is in the hand of the wrong person. But imagine money in the hand of a good person. Our world would be better for it. Am I saying the truth? Yeah. Yeah. Because it makes good things happen. Yeah. Make good things happen. Money takes the character of the handler. Money has no character of itself. It's just an instrument. It's just an instrument. And it's the love of the instrument that is the root of all issue, not the instrument. Yeah, not the instrument. Yeah. And many other things that money can buy, they are not the issue. The love of them is the issue. I mean, the love of car that will make you falsify figures to buy the car is the issue. Because the, the president of the scripture was when Jesus needed a car, he trusted God for one and he sent his disciple go to the place, you know, between Bethany and Bethphage. You see a place where two roads meet, you'll find a donkey that was tied there. Lose it. And if anybody asks you, tell them the Lord has a need of it. Yeah. For the work of the kingdom. Bring it. Yeah. You didn't have to. I have to understand what I'm saying. Yeah. So it's not bad to like a good car. But to love it. <laughs> to love it to the point that you can do anything for it, to get it, then it becomes a problem. Are you still with me today? Glory be to Jesus. So I can go on and on and on. Uh, there's many other scriptures that speak to different mindsets, mindsets about money and the fact that Maybe money is not good for you and I and it's going to take us away from God and, but nothing can be further from the truth. The Bible also says um, in Psalm 35 and verse 27 this one is very important Psalm 35 and verse 27 it says let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause and let them say continually let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. How many servants of Jehovah are here tonight? Can I see a show of hands? You're a servant of God. What did the scripture say? It says he has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Yeah. Let the Lord be magnified. Who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. In the prosperity of his servant. Glory be to Jesus. Somebody say after me tonight. I say the Lord delights in my prosperity. Say it's God's desire that I prosper. My needs are met, that my bills are paid, and that I live with more than enough. Come and say it again that I live with more than enough.
Glory be to Jesus. You know, if you live with more than enough and you're a righteous person, it means that what is the only thing that is left is for you to learn the principles of stewardship so that you can do the right thing with it. Let's get back a little bit to Abraham. We're talking about this blessing and this prosperity, and I'm laying a foundation, first and foremost, in the fact that we need to shift our thinking from the way we used to think before, especially if you have a, 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 a bit of a religious background. You need to shift your thinking a bit. Or maybe you, you don't even have a religious background, but you don't have any concept, any concept for the prosperity. I'm trying to create in your heart a, a Bible-based New Testament concept for divine prosperity. Because the concept that you hold on your mind that will determine how you recognize opportunity and how you refuse to recognize opportunities and how you take advantage of the favor of God and other benefits of the covenant from time to time. Because our minds are very powerful. So we need to think right about this so that we can get the right result. Glory be to Jesus. All right, Genesis chapter 12, when you start to read from there, you see from verse 1, God speaking to Abraham. He says, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And greatness there connotes also enjoying the glory of God. And glory means, means wealth. So that I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. The purpose of God's blessing on my life and your life is to be a blessing. Yeah. So that we can be a blessing. It's not to show off. It's not only to show that we know God. No. How do we show that we know God? The Bible says if you don't love your brother that you see, how can you then show that you love God that you cannot see? It's that we, sh we show that the love of God is at work in our heart by being a blessing. First and foremost to his kingdom and then to everyone around us. Because the great commandment says you love your, the Lord your God with all your heart and then you love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. So you love God and you love your neighbor. You'll be a blessing. That's the reason for the blessing. Said, I will bless those who bless you, verse 3, and curse them that curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So you see, in the blessing of God upon Abraham, there's a blessing of divine capacitation, greatness, the blessing of God's divine approval on everything that Abraham did. I will make your name great because your name is your brand. God says, I'm going to be behind anything that you establish, any brand that you establish. I'm going to make your name strong. Yeah. You or the families of the heart shall be blessed. And he, he then put a blessing of divine protection on him. Whoever touched you or attempt to do it, I deal with them. Yeah. God is a gangster. You know, gangster God. You know. If you belong to a gang, you understand what I'm saying? Can anybody touch you and then they won't come after the, the people? Am I saying the truth? That's the kind of promise God gave Abraham. You're you you not part of my gang. Anyone. You don't even need to touch you. They, you open their mouth. I shut the mouth. <laughs> I hope you're getting what I'm saying. That's, what, that's, that's the kind of blessing that God was giving Abraham. You join this gang now. Yeah. And me and the angels were gangsters. You understand? Yeah. Anybody decides to do anything, I send Michael to them. And you know Michael, like they say in my language, Kogbori <laughs> Bay. <laughs> Michael does not understand the uh, go come. You, you do what you're not supposed to do, it will deal with you. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Oh, is it Gabriel? Yeah, no, Gabriel. Yeah, Gabriel is the, is the, the, the chief of the, <laughs> the, the one who draws the sword. Yeah. Somebody is still with me today. That's the kind of blessing that God decided to put on Abraham. And this blessing became stronger and stronger. By Genesis 13, when you read from verse 1, Abraham had only had one encounter in Egypt. By Genesis 13, from verse 1 to 2, the Bible says that Abraham went from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him to the south. Verse 2, and Abraham was very rich in livestock, 
in silver and in gold. One chapter later, we already have reference to the fact that Abraham had become rich multidimensionally. I hope you understand what I'm saying. So it, it, it's very important that we see particular reference to the fact that Abraham was rich in the currency of his day. And by the time you get to Genesis 17, things have shifted. Abraham had gone. Yeah, because God was then talking to him and just saying, all the land you know, that you can see, I give to your descendants. God preserved an inheritance for his descendants that were not even born as at that time. Glory be to Jesus. So, fast forward. Some of the covenant blessings in the Old Testament, but I'll get to Deuteronomy. Abraham had come and gone. Isaac had given him back to, to uh, uh, Jacob. Jacob to Joseph. Joseph went to Egypt, was sold to slavery. Joseph became prime minister in Egypt. This years after Abraham, there was a famine in Canaan where Jacob was. Jacob and all his family, all the Jews, left for Egypt. And then they went into captivity in Egypt after many years, after Joseph and Jacob had gone, hundreds of years later. So, then God showed up for them and sent Moses to them. And Moses delivered them out of the hands of the eternity, the, 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 the uh, jo uh, Pharaoh. And then they moved out of Egypt. And then you start to see Moses delivering God's promises to them according to the promise that God had with Abraham. So, Deuteronomy chapter 8, when you read from verse 7, it says, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains, and springs that flow out of valley of hills and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees, of pomegranate, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without what? Somebody say without what? And which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills you will dig copper. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given to you. Glory be to Jesus. Does that sound like a blessing? Does that sound like God remembered the blessing that he placed on Abraham? Because this was written to biological Jews. Also, when you read Deuteronomy 28 from verse 1, Deuteronomy 28 from verse 1, can you give me Deuteronomy 28 from verse 1? Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. This was Moses delivering the word of God, the promises of God, to the descendants of Abraham, and by implication to all of us who shall become the descendants of Abraham through Christ. Are you still with me tonight? And all these blessings, verse 2, shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Look at the blessings. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall you shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your ground and the increase of your herd and the increase of your cattle and the offspring of, of your flock. That talks about the business because that was the business those days. Verse 4 says, Blessed shall be the, verse 5, Blessed shall be your basket and your needle bowl. That's your small scale industry, SMEs. Yeah. SMEs, you use basket and needle bowls. Yeah. Blessed shall be, shall you be when you come in. Blessed shall you be when you go out. 
the Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. See, the blessing of divine protection and divine preservation, the same way God promised Abraham. Because the full package of prosperity is not just about money. The underlining factor in prosperity is that the Bible says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin, but he will impute righteousness. And the Bible says, and Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. That's the blessing, first and foremost. The foundation for the blessing of Abraham is that God has imputed righteousness to us. And upon that righteousness will build every other thing. Every other thing. So the Bible says, the Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. He shall come, against, come out against you one way and shall flee before you seven ways. Look at verse 8. The Lord will command a blessing on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand and it will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to, to you, if you keep the commandment of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Glory be to Jesus. I've read all these scriptures for you to understand, you know, the breath and the, the death of the blessing that we have in Abraham. One is that it transcends riches. There are so many dimensions to it. But being wealthy is part of it. It's a major part of it. It's a major part of it. It's a major part of it. Praise God. I said, Praise God. Can you help me look at your neighbor again? I'm blessed. Exceedingly prosperous. Say 2018. There shall be many more manifestations of the blessing of God over my life. It shall be multi dimensional, just like it was in the days of Abraham. Glory be to Jesus. So it's extremely important that we understand this. That we are blessed. And that the Bible says God delights in the prosperity of his servant. Because he has already blessed us. Totem 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. That's God's desire for us. So the big question in the mind of many people is, okay, if all of us are blessed, if all of us are blessed, you know, remember another scripture, Second Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Bible says, for you, know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians 8 and verse 9. For you, know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In that though he was rich, yet he became poor. That through his poverty, you can become rich. <laughs> Glory be to Jesus. Somebody say, I'm rich. Say it again, say, I'm rich. For you know grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, for my sake, he became poor. That through his poverty, I might become rich. With all that I've said tonight, I'm sure the question in somebody's mind is that, why do we still have poor Christians? Is that not, I mean, are you not thinking that way? Yeah. Or someone may even be asking, how come I am not rich? I said, let's not go too far. But in the last thing by saying, how come I am not rich? Let's get into it gradually. Luke, 7, Luke 15, let's read from verse 17 to 32. We're reading the story of the lost son, or what we call traditionally the political son. In Luke chapter 15, we're reading the story of the prodigal son or the lost son. When you read from the beginning, you see that the Bible talks about this man. Don't forget it's a parable. Jesus was telling a story to buttress a point. And when you read a parable of Jesus, it has the primary purpose for the parable and it has secondary learnings or learning curves from the same parable. In this parable, the main thing 
that Jesus was trying to portray to us was the character of our father. The character of our father. The kind of father that we have in God. So he said, this man, who is a rich man, had two sons. And one of his sons, the younger one, came and met his father and said, give to me my inheritance. I want to take my inheritance. Sharp guy. The father gave him his inheritance and off he went. Went into another country and the Bible says he engaged in riotous living. He wasted everything that his father gave him. He didn't have any mind of investing or getting into industry or any kind of entrepreneurial inclination. All he thought about was pleasure and, you know, just have fun with the citizens of the country. The Bible says after a while, he lost everything that he had to the point that he was going to eat with, you know, the pigs there. So, uh, um, Verse, uh, let's go to verse 15. So the Bible says, Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of the country, and he sent him into his field to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pots that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. He wanted the food of the swine, but they, couldn't, they didn't even give him. They said, just feed them. If, we, if you touch I'm supposed to go to the mouth of the pig. If it comes to your mouth, we deal with you. That's when he knew that he, he, he has finished. Yeah. I'm sure he took the, the, the job because he felt, at least I'll be feeding these people and I'll be feeding myself too, you know. And then he, he got a stern warning. If this thing enter your mouth. <laughs> but when he came to himself, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. When he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. Somebody say compassion. Very strong word. Very strong word. It connotes very strong emotions. Compassion. And ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Father, but, is, but the father said to him, bring out the best robe and put on him and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and bring the father's calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to do what? Now, let's see the part two of the gist. The older son. Yeah. The older son. You know, I told you that the parable has the basic and then there are other ancillary gist around it. The older son, who is like the modern day religious Christian. Older son. You know, there are uncles of God in every church. <laughs> so the older son. Now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music. Hey, look at the kind of music they're playing in church. And dancing. How can somebody be dancing like this in church? He heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted cow. The moment this guy had it, his head flew off. Look at what happened, verse 28. Then he was angry 
but he was angry and would not go on. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment. He was a very holy guy. Never trans transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. Let me pause here. I don't want to use all my time to read this scripture. This is the point I'm trying to make. Jesus told this parable to teach us the character of our Father. One thing you must learn from this parable is that God is always thinking good about me, even when I'm inoculate, even when I'm misbehaving. He's always thinking about me. He's, he's always wanting me to come back because the pathway to the, to the house of God or to the heart of God is a pathway to prosperity. Yeah. Nobody wants anybody prosperous more than God, not even the devil. Yeah. God wants me prosperous much more than any other person wants me prosperous. God wants me prosperous more than the devil wants me prosperous, more than the, the, the most loving person in my life wants me prosperous. So this guy, that's part of the fact that he had his first, you know, opportunity and messed up. And somebody may be here tonight, you've had an opportunity. Maybe you have made it big before. You are now down to the bottom of the barrel. God is interested in you coming back up. Say amen, somebody. Amen. God is interested in you coming back up. Someone may even be here tonight. You came from, you know, uh, the Bible says God is the one that raised the poor out of the dung hill and set them among the prince of his people to reign. That's the character of God. God is always looking out for us, wanting us to make the course correction that is necessary. The problem with many believers is that we're not strategic. You see, when the Bible says the prodigal son started to talk to himself, he then hatched a plan. What is the plan to maximize what the father has for you? He had to come to himself. Where I came from, we had riches and wealth in our house. That's the kingdom of God. The Bible says, and the presence of God is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, pleasures forever, evermore. If the devil is robbing you of joy or pleasure, you need to remember in the presence of your father, where you came from, there's no lack there. This guy had a plan on how to go back home, how to get closer to God, how to know God more intimately. That's the problem with many Christians. The moment we get to that place where we become a bit uncomfortable with where we are, and you know, then the hunger for breakthrough, I want to hammer, before you know it, it's taking us further and further from God rather than bringing us back to God. Somebody's following me tonight. Yeah? Taking us further and further from God. Some of the most troublesome people on earth, most cantankerous, and who can cheat the living daylight out of you, they're very poor. Am I saying the truth? Some poor people cheat much more. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Some people think only rich people are bad people. No. 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 A sister in this church was telling me just this January, this last January, or is it late December, how she traveled and then gave a driver the key to one of the cars and say, all the Christmas gifts are giving you. It's too big. Put everything in this car. Drive this car to your house. Drop all these gifts, these gifts I've given you in your house. Return my car. And she was on, on her way to the airport to travel. That car never came back home. And this guy has been driving her for how long? I know the guy personally. Yeah, because, she, I mean, she's one of our ministers, she's my friend. This guy has been driving her for years. The guy was busy cruising the car all over the place until, is it 1st of January or something like that, that armed robbers attacked him and took the car from him. As I speak, the car has not been found. Yeah? I mean, what, what do you say to that? Because some people think, oh, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> where the people are very wicked. And poverty teaches people sense. Poverty doesn't take sense. <laughs> Now, I just want to underscore a point to you. <laughs> yeah. Poverty doesn't teach sense. Sometimes it makes people much more wicked. 
Glory be to Jesus. God wants us to be able to retrace our steps back to him from time to time. The greatest strategy you, may, you can come up with is a strategy that will bring you closer to God. Closer to his plans for your life. Where you can encounter his compassion. Where you can, encounter, where you can touch his heart. Because his thought towards you are thoughts of good and not of evil. Always looking for how to spring a party concerning you. Yeah, bring something big. That's how God thinks about me. Somebody say with me tonight. When, when the prodigal son got back home, the father threw a party. Killed a fatted cow, you know, and all that. Put a ring in his hand, you know, clothes on, on, on him. You know, the, the brother of the prodigal son, the very religious guy, he had the skinny goat mindset. Yeah. Can you go to mindset? Said his father, you know, not even that all this I've been serving you, I've not broken any commandment and all that. And all I was even thinking about is skinny goat. <laughs> yeah. Skinny goat mindset. Just give me, you should just give me skinny goat, you know, and all that. And God is saying, there are fatted calves here. Yeah. That I really want to give you. And all you needed to do was to have asked. Just, just ask. That was all you needed. Just ask. Just ask. Glory be to Jesus. Just ask, and then I'll give you. Somebody say for me tonight. Very, very important. So there, there are, let me just wrap this all up with about three things that I believe stop believers from encountering what God has given us. One is what I just spoke about. The skinny goat mindset. A skinny goat mindset. Every believer that has a skinny goat mindset will not go far with God when it comes to divine prosperity. Skinny goat mindset. You know, I just want to be okay. I just want a little. I'm not asking for much, you know. Give me neither riches, no poverty. Just put me borderline. Yeah. Yeah. That guy had that borderline mindset. I'm not asking for much. It's just a skinny goat. Just give me small. Yeah. When Jesus was about to feed 5,000. And the Bible says that a young boy brought a, um, a lunch pack for them to. But before they encountered the boy with a lunch pack, Jesus asked his disciples, Philip, where can we get bread that we can feed all these people? Uh, Philip said, a hundred denarii what? Will not be enough. And if you go and study that place very well, that hundred denarii was the annual wage you know, for the average worker like Philip in his day. That was the highest amount of money that Philip ever seen, had ever seen in his life. Yeah. He said, if I bring my one year salary to this crusade ground, Reverend Jesus, and I donate it, <laughs> and I just donate it, we will still not be able to feed all these people, even if we give them a little. That little mindset is always a problem. Philip said, even if we give just a little, just a little, just little, it will still not be enough. And Jesus, his plan was that they won't get a little. His plan was that everyone will eat, they will still take 12 baskets of leftover. Have you seen that in your Bible before? 12 baskets of leftover. Each disciple took one basket home to show that Jesus is a good Jesus. <laughs> you know you can extrapolate the scripture. Because what are they going to do with 10 baskets? These are 12 disciples. <laughs> what else should they do with 10 baskets? And Jesus said, gather all the fragments that nothing may waste. Ah, I can imagine John the Beloved. <laughs> Say something like, Uncle Peter, Claire, this particular basket is going on with me tonight. Peter could not say anything because they are, I mean, they are 12. So everybody help yourself. You can imagine a disciple of Jesus getting home with basket. Fool. Ah, he said, what happened at the crusade ground today? Jesus is a good Jesus. So. <laughs> yeah. All the neighborhood, like we say in this part of the world, around the yard, everybody will go to crusade ground the next day. Because they will have had something for dinner that will show that, ah, ah, correct Jesus. 
how can I say? But you remember where this started from. Philip said, 100 in a row what will not be enough even if we give each person a little. The plan of Jesus was not to give a little, but to make everybody eat and be filled. And then there will still be left over. I pray tonight that God will deliver somebody from skinny goat mindset. I pray tonight that God will deliver somebody from small, small mindset. Amen. From not enough mindset. Amen. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Another thing that stops believers from being able to engage and really walk in riches is worry. worry. Like I was teaching on Sunday. What you worry about eventually will become your God. Worry leads to fear. Matthew 6, when you read verse 25 and 26, can you put that up for me? Matthew 6, 25 and 26. It says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. It's not life more than food and the body more than clothing. This was Jesus speaking to his disciples and the crowd. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap, now gather into bands, yet their heavenly Father feeds them. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of more value than they are? Same thing I've been talking about. How you value yourself in God's economy and within God's family is very important. God doesn't have firstborn or secondborn or lastborn. All of us are children of God. And the value that you place on yourself, how you embrace the love of God is extremely important. Jesus said, the things that are useless to God, that are just part of the ecosystem, food chain, you know, that you're supposed to eat, God takes care of them. What about you? Because the moment you allow worry to set in, you will come out of God's divine economy and create your own and step into the devil's economy. Worry makes you to lose trust in God. Yeah. And the moment you lose trust in God, you may still be in church, but you are no longer under God's economy. One of the things that will happen is that you will not give as you ought to give. The Bible says there is he that scatters and yet increase. There is he that we told more than is necessary because of worry and anxiety and fear of poverty. Then it tends to poverty even though it's a child of God. How I wish that many believers will understand the concept of God's law. And the fact that God doesn't want us to worry about mundane things. And we put our full trust in him. And we give. And we follow him. And we demonstrate generosity to man and to God. And then see God break out in our direction like a plague. I'm telling you the truth. You, you, you just see God just break out in your direction. But the moment we start to worry so much, and the funny thing about worry is that worry lacks substance. Jesus said there, how many of you, by worrying, can add a cubit to your height? What Jesus said is that worry lacks power of performance. It's like seedless grape. It cannot reproduce itself. <laughs> I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. There's no seed in worry that can bring forth any fruit. If it brings forth any fruit at all, it's a fruit of fear and fruit of destruction. Destruction of health, destruction. That's what, what comes out of worry. Yeah. One of the greatest ways you can demonstrate that you are a fully devoted follower of Jesus is to cease from worrying after material things. That's why Jesus said in 33 of, verse 3 of Matthew 6 there, seek your first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. They are supposed to be additions. If we make them the main deal, we will struggle with poverty. Our, our attention and our love will shift from God and shift into material things. That's why many Christians are not touching real wealth. Jesus said, you can't serve God and mammon. And he said, it's he that is faithful in little things and more is committed to his hand. Yeah. You know, it's possible for a believer, and that, that's, that's, that will be my last point, it's possible for a believer to tight, to be tightened. And still be struggling. Why? 
God will open the windows of heaven when you tithe. But what you do with the 90%, God is still concerned about it. <laughs> because it's the 90% that God is going to use what is left to multiply. If it's called what is left, you can still remain in poverty. What is zero times zero? <laughs> I'm sure somebody is getting understanding from this. The Bible says, this is my last point, which is that wastefulness and bad management is another reason why many believers are not touching the tangibility of the blessing in times of wealth. Proverbs 21 and, um, and, and verse 20. It says, there is desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but the foolish man squanders it all. There is this desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man squanders it all. Desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise. A foolish man squanders it all. A foolish man is the one who is a waster. If there's anyone listening to me here tonight, because this series will not be complete until we speak to our capacity to manage what God has given us. Anyone that's listening to me tonight, you earn an income. And at the end of the month, you finish everything. The Bible says you are foolish. Not me, the Bible. Yeah, it says you are foolish. The Bible says that your wisdom pipe is blocked. Yeah, that's what it says. I don't care about the excuse that you give. It's a foolish man that squanders it all. Anyone that's listening to me here tonight, you don't have savings. The Bible says you are foolish. <laughs> Not me. You know I'm a loving pastor. Yeah. But the Bible says you are foolish. Yeah. Listen to me here tonight. Or listen to me, you are online. You don't have a savings. And you have been earning income for a while right now. Eh? And you don't have anything in savings. Except your savings has been plugged into an investment or a project that is not a liability, that is an asset. You are foolish. That's what the scripture says. That foolishness of yours has tied the hand of God. It cannot do much as far as your divine prosperity in terms of wealth is concerned. Keep you in good health, you know, and all that. You enjoy peace, but see, this thing will come money. It may not come like it's supposed to come. Let me buttress this last day tonight. Matthew 25, when you read from verse 20. Matthew 25, you see, you know, from about maybe verse 17 or so, you see the parable of talent. It's when you read from verse 20 there. You see what the master said to the guy who got five talent and came with another five. So he who had received five talent came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. Look at what his, his Lord said to him. Don't forget this is a parable. The parable explains kingdom economics. Kingdom lifestyle and all that. That's what the parables of Jesus do. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's the same thing he said to the guy with two, but he said something different to the guy with one who brought only one back. He said, to him that has, that which he has will be taken away from him. Or to him that has not, sorry. He said, that which he has will be taken away from him. That's the one that lacks the capacity to multiply. That lacks the diligence and the mental agility to think through a process. To say, what can I do with what I have so I can multiply it? God's providential help comes 
not on anything that is static, but anything that is in motion. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. God's providential help comes on, let me use agriculture as an example. You have a seed of maize or beans in your hand. As long as it is in your hand, that's the best that it can be. Because it cannot attract providential help. The moment it leaves your hand into the ground, God's providential help gets into that ground, which is already embedded in the ground, comes upon it, breaks it up, makes it to sprout. The Bible says, God, who gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Seed to the sower and bread to the eater. There's something to eat, there's something to sow. The one that you sow is the one that has capacity to multiply. The one that you eat is gone forever. And many Christians only have mouth to eat. They don't have hand to sow. So, the blessing of Abraham will continually look like it's not available to them, but yet it is. Many Christians have little, little mindset, so they don't aspire. I said the blessing of God does not come on anything that is static. It comes on anything that is in process. It gets into that process and does something to that process. If the process needs a catalyst, it becomes a catalyst on the process. If the process needs a bit of favor to make it work faster, it goes in there. If the process needs wisdom to widen you know, the channel of flow, to widen it, that's how the blessing of God works. Not on static stuff. Not on static stuff. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So for us to start to see more of the blessings of Abraham in full manifestation in our life, we need to get into motion. Mentally, physically. Think through processes. Think through strategies. Come up with tangible plans. And develop skills at managing what is left after we have given to God. When you give 10% to God, if you are still at that level of just 10% to God, when you give 10% to God, God is interested in what you do with the 90. If you are a waster with the 90, it destroys the blessing that the 10% that locks you into the blessing of Abraham should bring upon you. So it looks like it lacks effect, but it does have effect. There's much treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise. But a foolish man squanders it all. It's contra. Even if he's a believer and the child of Abraham cannot be rich. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. Lift your two hands to Jesus tonight and just bless Jesus. And just ask him for wisdom tonight. Just tell him, Lord, I want to step to the next level. I want the blessing of Abraham to become apparent in my life. I don't want to be an onlooker in your kingdom or in your house. I receive grace to think better. I receive grace for greater demonstration of wisdom. Greater demonstration of wisdom in my life. And this month, we were speaking about getting stronger in generosity. As I get stronger in generosity, give me grace. Give me grace to do the right things with what you have placed in my hand. To make the right decisions with what you are placed in my hand. Somebody needs to pray tonight. Lord, help me to deal with the small, small mindset. The skinny goat mindset. I want grace to be able to aspire. Every trace of skinny goat mindset. Lord, help me. Help me to flush them out. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's what the scripture says. Give me grace to deal with skinny goat mindset in my career, in my business. Give me grace to deal with skinny goat mindset. Somebody needs to pray tonight. Lord, help me to build a bigger channel to take your blessing. Some of us are, are you know, when we're supposed to be fishing with fishing trawlers, we're using fishing hook. You need a bigger channel through which the blessing of God can flow through. In the bigger channel, you need grace to be able to maximize that which God is putting in, 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 under your influence, which God is putting in your hand, which God is putting around you. 
Somebody pray tonight. Pray tonight. Pray tonight. Pray tonight. Lord, I know you are faithful to your promise. I want to maximize grace. I want to maximize your promise over my life. I want 2018 to be a year of turnaround. That your blessings will come into full manifestation in my life. I'm not too young to be wealthy. I'm not too young to be a mega blessing to the kingdom of God and to everyone around me. I'm not too young to be a blessing to Nigeria. A mega blessing. Just, just in the same way that your tithe can transform a church and transform the kingdom of God in its effect that can create somebody's tax. The tax of your company can also change Africa. That's why we should not aspire small. That's why we should not aspire small. God wants to make us a blessing. Nigeria needs money. If you create wealth and you pay taxes, this nation will never be the same again. If you create wealth and you pay tithe, all the unreached places in Africa will be rich with the gospel of Jesus. The gospel will go on the media, will go to the news and crannies of the unreached part of this country and unreached part of Africa and other parts of the world. That's how it works. We are blessed to be a blessing. To be a blessing to the kingdom. To be a blessing to our nation. To be a blessing to our industry. Somebody pray tonight as we round up. Lord, make me a blessing. Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing. America is a rich nation because its citizens are creating wealth. When they bring the money back home and they bring the taxes back home, then America is a rich nation. Lord, make me a blessing. Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing to Nigeria. I know things may not be working right, right now, but you can empower me and through me, whether in and out of, of, of governance or, 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 or politics, I can make a difference. I can make a difference. In or out of governance, I can make a difference. With the blessing of God upon my life. Father, we thank you. Lord, we bless your name. Wave your hands to Jesus tonight and bless him all over this place. Thank him for his blessings over your life. Thank him for his blessings over your life. Father, we thank you for your blessing. We thank you for access that we have in Christ Jesus. And we bless you tonight. We give you glory and we give you praise. In the precious name of Jesus. With all that's bowed and all eyes closed, can I pray for someone in this service tonight who may be saying, I'm still a Gentile. Listen, I'm not sure that I'm born again and I'm not sure that Christ is in my life. I want to give my life to Jesus. Somebody may say, I gave my life to Jesus before my back slid into sin and I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. Pastor, pray for me. I want to pray with you right now. I want to pray with you right now. All you need to recognize is that you cannot help yourself. Jesus is the one that has a saving grace and he wants to save you tonight. He wants to save your, your soul from destruction. If there's anyone tonight you want to say a prayer with me, you want to submit your life to Jesus, or you just want to rededicate your life to Jesus, if you belong to any of those two categories, please lift your right hand above your head and let me say a prayer with you. Lift your right hand above your head, let me say a prayer with you. Jesus will come into your life. You will be able to say boldly that I have a covenant with God to our Lord Jesus Christ. The covenant of Abraham, the blessing of Abraham is upon my life. You'll be able to boldly say that. If you are lifting your hand, lift it well. Let me know you're joining me in this prayer. Let me know you're joining me in this prayer. If your hand is up, I want you to say after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I accept that I'm a sinner. I ask that you forgive me my sins and that you cleanse me from every unrighteousness. I accept you tonight as my Lord and my personal Savior. Come into my life. Forgive me my sins and accept me into your kingdom. Thank you.
for accepting me. 